All right, everyone, welcome to this evening's pro seminar. I'm Charles Stankovich, and it's my pleasure to introduce the guest tonight, Philippa Ramos. Um, just a few words before we get into that. Tonight's actually a redux, or the second time around as we try to have Philippa speak. Um, for those of you who have been tuning into our lecture series the last couple of years, we had her book actually last March. 17th, but was our first event canceled when we had to go into lockdown. So obviously it was a little bit before that, trying to get Philippa to speak and come. And so we're really excited and then it was delayed. So 10 months later, I'm glad we're actually seeing this through. The event is part of the, the research trajectory of the pro seminar, which kicked off with the drowned world last year. And people with Margaret Humo, Philippa was supposed to be um, a really important part of that conversation. Then Angela Shubat and Kapwani. Um, so it's, it's great to kind of invite her into that um, conversation to continue a lot of these questions on the post-human and the ethics and thinking through and with animals, particularly in ecological issues. Um, the original talk was along that lines and then obviously the pandemic happened and she was flexible enough and concerned enough to want to actually readjust the talk to the topic of the pandemic and the virus um, course. Um, 10 months later, we're all in the same situation or similar or even being in the same means something else. So it's really great that she's really stuck with this. She's always talking about really relevant things. So I'm, I'm glad we're doing that. And the vulnerability of her working through and testing some things out is a really great thing. So I'm looking forward to that conversation tonight. We also have a few more speakers in the series left in this term. We have on February 23rd, a Nigerian London based um, science fiction writer um, by the name of Anissa Okuchi. So please come and tune in for that. It'll be a really great counterpart and continuation. There'll be a reading of her fictional work in a question and answer discussion. We also have then uh, following that Lauren Fournier um, with her book launch um, for MIT in conversation with uh, Pamela Martu on March 16th and then closing it off is with Rui Amaral. Again, that was a cancellation from last year, literally a year. Um, so we rescheduled him, um, the uh, adjunct curator of MOCA. Tonight's talk, as I said, was a reschedule. It was originally partnered with Mercer Union. So it's great to kind of keep that conversation going with them. So always great to do the lecture series and partner with them. The uh, guest tonight probably doesn't need a long introduction because you're here and you've probably seen her bio, but I just want to highlight a few things. Obviously, she's one of the most important voices in our world, asking questions about animals um, and how to think with them. She edited the journal, or sorry, the book, the, the, the volume Animals for Whitechapel Gallery and MIT, with some connection to our faculty. She's also the co-founder and co-curator of Vidrome, a really great online platform for video screening, something um, that seemed a little more special pre-COVID when all the museums went online like this. So. Again, Philip has been behind that the whole time and again, some great connections with our faculty screening and writing for that um, platform. She's teaching currently in the Masters of, Res of Research at Central St. Martins um, and she's also um, teaching at the Basel Art Institute. She's been an editor for Art Agenda, uh, Manifesta, for Documenta, curator for the Shang Biennial as well as Basel Film. So she comes with a lot of great experience uh, across the board from writing and curating and programming. And it's with that, that I wanna pass this over and look forward to tonight's conversation and Philippa. A quick note, technically, there's the Q&A interface that we'd love you to use to ask, I guess, a more formal question. We've also let the chat open um, to ask some questions like Ashley, whether it will be recorded and where we'll post that. So that's um, fine to use either, um, but again, we'll, kind of ask you at the end to try to use the Q&A so we know it's actually a question and maybe just not a comment we can focus in on that also we even more encourage you to raise your hand um and so we can get your question orally I know Philippa would love to hear from you and have that conversation a little more dynamic than a, a chat box but of course all these options are open and available to you and we uh, are excited to hear from you Philippa so I'll pass it over to you thanks for doing this tonight Charles, thank you so much for the really warm and generous introduction. And thank you so much, not for inviting me once, but twice. And it's really, of course, needlessly say, it's a real shame that I can't be in Toronto and um, actually be in person here. 
hopefully this will happen one day but um yeah it's been it's really a pleasure to be in contact with you throughout these whole months you are certainly memorable for um for the rest of our lives and thank you also for to renee for organizing and providing um the support for um for this talk which i should say is um I think it's one of the latest talks that I've ever made. It's uh, it's 11:40 p.m. here in in France where I am right now, so it feels a bit it feels very special and a little bit like otherworldly to be to be giving a talk at um, at this at this time. Um, and uh, I should just add to something that you mentioned in the in the biography because I I. I find it a really interesting connection is actually that, in my opinion, one of the most remarkable and original and uh, extremely well thought texts of the animal um, book compilation, the one published with MIT Press in the Whitechapel that you refer to um, is a text by someone who, who teaches at, at Daniels, who's Mitchell Akiyama. Um, and, uh, and I think it's a, Without being, without making promotion of the book, I would strongly encourage everyone who is either familiar or not with Mitchell's um, ideas and, and writing and very original way of um, existing across theory and practice to to go to go through that text and discover animalness through sound and oral experiences. Um, and having said this, I will I will uh, start my. Uh, my presentation, and I I should just add that it's um, it's it's something that it's 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 a reflection that is both extremely that has a very strange um, I don't know if uh, well managed or not balance between being very grounded and very uh, real and down to earth and then also being quite speculative. So I, I hope this, this combination between getting in and out of the real um, makes any kind of sense. Um, let's see. I tidy the kitchen using some not so organic cleaning products. I go for a walk with the dog who's eager to prey on the entire wildlife of the marshes. I read the UK news online and I feel overtaken by anxiety. I read the Portuguese news online and my anxiety grows even more. I text my father about the new heater he's installing. Lisbon is experiencing an abnormal cold wave at the moment. I text with a friend about how to make a good fire and not burn the wood too fast nor too slow. I Google which countries have no COVID and end up reading about the collateral effects of the virus namely the impact of lack of visitors in tourist reliant Pacific nations and the resultant collapse of some economies. I read the Spanish news online and I feel even more anxious. Maybe I've learned so many languages as to be able to procrastinate my duties by jumping from one international press to another. Then I text my Madrid friends about the snowstorm. I listen to Susan Sontag in conversation with John Berger on YouTube. They talk about fiction and narrative and I feel jealous of how they don't have the virus colonizing their thoughts. I then discover and read a short story Sontag wrote about an imaginary travel to China. And I wonder where will my next travel be while knowing I should be not desiring to ever travel again. I use a strong bleach to remove the stains of some garments and then throw out the baby with the bleachy water feeling that the ecologist in me is just a hypocrite. I refill the bird feeder with seeds, compensating for how people damage the bird's natural habitats and resources. I let the cat out, knowing I shouldn't be letting the cat out when the hungry birds are feasting on the new seeds. I read a short story by Anne Boyer, because I always read Anne Boyer when I'm in need of inspiration. I then Google Anne Boyer and hop from one image to another, looking at her incredibly thick and temperamental hair. I drink another cup of tea looking out the window and wondering how on earth did I end up in the deep countryside sharing a life 
and many worries with two cats, one dog, two adopted donkeys, two adopted horses, and endless amounts of birds to whom I feed, care for, and talk to every day. This was a list of some of the things I did during these last days instead of preparing this lecture. I'm sharing them with you because these gestures matter. Some of the individual situations may be familiar, boring, or even funny to some or to most of you, but they are not that relevant. Yet they matter because they're both a symptom and a portrait of the times we're living in. They are rooted in our times, and if they were repeated on another moment, they would not have the same significance. Right now, they are physical and mental features which indicate the state of malaise, agitation, confusion and dispersion some, or I suspect many, people are experiencing. But they are also conscious and subconscious ways to take time to think, to create generative means to find solace and motivation, and to attune ourselves to the pace of the times, to change and to the unknown. They also matter because they are attempts to draft figurations. And figurations are extremely important tools to deal with the present. Figuration allow us to come to terms with reality, to imagine transformation and envisage a future aligned with what we may desire. Figurations are crucial in a moment of crisis of imagination such as ours, where it's difficult to make plans, to project, to find a solid ground upon which to build strategies and come up with ideas. Figurations, which I'm defining here as image concepts, have received important meanings in the recent years. Astrid and Amanis, some of you may know because she wrote this, um, this book that I like very much, I find quite incredible, called Bodies of Water. And Astrid and Neimanis describes figurations as projective entities. She says they are, quoting, embodied concepts grounded in our materiality for imagining and living otherwise. Donna Haraway, who writes about figures and not about figurations, names them material semiotic knots. She says, figures collect the people through their invitation to inhabit the corporeal story told in their lineaments. Figures are not representations or didactic illustrations, but rather material semiotic notes or knots in which diverse bodies and meanings co-shape one another. For me, she continues, figures have always been where the biological and literary or artistic to come together with all of the force of lived reality. My body itself is just a figure, literally. Finally, Rosie Braidotti adds an important cartographic element to the meaning of figurations when she sustains that they are living maps that acknowledge concretely situated historical positions and the rise in response to a particular contemporary question or problem. Figurations, therefore, are a fundamental reference that allow individuals to make sense of the world and trust that improvement is desirable, but also conceivable. Within my own area of work, I've been interested in conceiving figurations as potential instruments for environmental change. Environment, both of term, of terms of, in terms of, of nature and, and, and culture. I've been trying to understand how the tools of art media studies and cultural theory may propose figurations that allow people not only to visualize the correlation between modernity's positions in relation to nature and the other, namely those that legitimizes processes of extractivism, colonialism and fossil fuel addictions, and the deriving degradation of the physical, mental and emotional life on all species of the planet, but also to understand how to initiate concrete and effective forms of change. In the context of this interest in figurations, exactly one year ago, while I was preparing this lecture, which originally was meant to take place in April 2020, as Charles was, was saying in the beginning, I was trying to comprehend the relationship between the emergence of COVID-19 and the troubled state of the world, seeing the virus not as a cause, but as a symptom and I was attempting to understand what figurations this situation might be able of generating from the moment in which it was drastically forcing people 
to revise their lives and priorities and to actualize their imaginaries and sets of references. Basically, I was trying to understand what figurations this virus might, try, might trigger. And in order to do so, I went, I discussed and I interviewed several experts, including two scientists from the, labo from the Laboratory of Molecular Genetics at the Rockefeller Institute in New York. They were the senior research associate, Lisa Pomerantz, and the research associate, Leah Kelly, whose input was crucial to me. One of the aspects of the research that I was interested in exploring concerned the interconnections between wildlife decimation, poaching, and illegal and legal trades between Africa and Asia. Yet, I was also concerned about the dangers and limitations of this research. First and foremost, I fear to clumsily step into a minefield of cultural difference. The risk of being biased in my analysis of, for instance, a Chinese wet market selling exotic species, where it's thought that the first cases of the virus might have infected humans, was too evident. Who was I to pronounce myself about a context of which I knew so little, when my own relationship to animal objectification and commerce is highly ambig ambiguous? After all, just to give two very uh, blatant examples, I feed my dog and cats beef, poultry, and other animals derivates, and I'm impatient to get a vaccine that will protect me from COVID-19. But whose making caused so much animal sufferance, from the squalene hydrocarbon that is obtained from shark liver oil, to the rhesus macaques, the baboons, the marmosets that were used as models for understanding the behavior of the virus in humans, and the many more mice, monkeys, ferrets, pigs, hamsters, that were literally turned into guinea pigs to test the efficacy of deficiency of the vaccine. And so are a calf, a chicken, a shark, or a baboon less deserving of a good life than a bat and a pangolin? I don't think so. And yet the danger of blaming certain practices because I have less understanding of them was too clear to me when I was doing this research. And aware of these problematic, um, of these dangers that I might be incurring. I was about to abort my research um, on these potential figurations emerging from the virus, when during one of our conversations, Leah Kelly suggested me to take the poetic license of imagining what the virus might feel, might want, or think. This animistic take seemed like a bizarre proposal coming from a scientist, but the temptation to imagine not the human, but the viral practice of figuration was irres irresistible. And indeed, I followed her advice, which turned into a text that ended up by being published in the Contemporary Journal, which is a, an online publication affiliated to a UK-based um, um, public art gallery called Nottingham Contemporary. And the, the text was entitled, What the Virus Wants, and it articulated my speculations about the agency of the SARS-CoV-2, the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, the virus that causes the disease, which we call COVID-19. Um, and I speculated about the agency of the virus, its possibilities, its limits, its paradoxes. And as a diligent storyteller, I started from the beginning, when it was likely that the virus wanted nothing, I wrote. The virus was fine where it was. I don't think it was looking to hop anywhere. Probably this was not a very ambitious virus. It was warm, dark, and cozy there, probably inside a furry, warm-blooded mammal who could fly like a bird, hear like a machine, and be suspended like a fruit. Then the virus was carried away and started traveling from one body to another, attuning itself to the life it encountered. It was only in recent times that the likelihood of an animal carrier reaching a far off location, a life, and of a human carrier surviving an infection from an unknown path pathogen, and of the animal and human carriers remaining close to other animal and humans grew exponentially. Advanced infrastructure, medicine, and communication are highly effective vectors for, vectors for a virus. Accelerated transmission became the propeller of both the modern world and the modernized virus. The virus found itself everywhere and in everything. 
It throve across global population, density and traffic, and learned to master virality. As a single individual, animal or human, can spread it to so many other individuals. In a few months, the virus managed more than the joint effects of humans and algorithms. For decades, people and bots have attempted to compress and dwarf the planet, connecting, uniting, and merging places, things, and beings, calculating and reducing the degree of separation that ties every single individual to everyone else, virtually inviting the friends of the friends to become friends. And the virus was caught within the spirit. Now it believes that you and me and them are us, that we are one that you and me and them are made of the same stuff, that we breathe and speak and laugh and spit and sneeze and fever and cough alike, that we rejoice and revel and cry and suffer and love and hate alike, that tragedy, contingency, dispossession and comedy happen to all. This virus, which was brought from its happy latency into a state of global circulation, now wants to show that you and me and them are us. Basically, in this text, I attempted to imagine the figurations of this virus that, by hopping from one being to another, realized that what unifies life on Earth is much more than what divides it. I continued, the virus believes that you and me and them are us, that we are one, that you and me and them are made of the same stuff, that we breathe and speak and laugh and spit and sneeze and fever and cough alike that we rejoice and revel and cry and suffer and love and hate alike, that tragedy, contingency, dispossession and comedy happen to all. But I attempted to imagine the virus's limits too. What the virus ignores is that despite being the same, we are far from being the same. Some of us are historically and genetically and politically and sexually and geographically better positioned than others in this entanglement. We call existence. You and me and them and us may well be the same, but we are not all equipped the same way. We have been endowed with, with uneven features, powers and agencies. Our capacity to act is different. I can object, you are subjected, they can decide, we are subjugated. And the problems that are, may arise from this were, were clear to me. The issue I wrote, is that wanting to rebalance our togetherness, to a large extent, the virus is perpetuating the state we live in and the logics we operate by. And sometimes the virus ends up by reinforcing those same foundation it is aiming at. Despite the exceptions, the virus largely extends the agency of those who already have it. It makes an even distribution even more uneven. It redistributes power to the powerful, access to the validated, wealth to the wealthy, health to the healthy. The virus wants to change everything for everything to change. But for now, the virus is changing everything for everything to remain the same. But what the virus wants and the virus gets are two different things. Now, almost one year later, I'm trying to comprehend where I succeeded and failed in this exercise of fabulation. And I, I believe I was right in avoiding a moralizing interpretation of the virus's actions. As it's clear now, even more than the SARS-CoV-2 is not a revengeful organism aimed at punishing humanity for its wrongdoings. I believe I was also right in arguing that despite its virtuosity and strangeness, to human logics, the virus was caught in the world's web of extractive and exploitative capitalism, reinforcing its uneven distribution of inequality and toxicity. Yeah, I think that was also wrong. And I was wrong in focusing exclusively on what the virus wanted, because in doing so, I failed to address something equally important, which is an attempt to try to understand what we humans, or at least what some of us humans, may want from the virus. As I mentioned, this we is a tricky term. As Rosie Braidotti argues, we are in this together, but we are not one and the same. And in fact, this we of the question, what we may want from the virus is a multi-layered concept that comprises various agencies. At the same time, this question of what we may want from the virus is relevant 
but it's also extremely banal, complex and uneven, and ultimately impossible to answer. The question is banal because the ultimate answer is really simple. We want the virus to disappear. The question is complex because when you start exploring the systems that are being put in place to placate the virus, you quickly understand that different people and different groups of people, different we's, I would say, want different things from it. And that some of them are learning, experiencing, but also benefiting from it. You also understand that the temptation to extract something from the virus is real, which shows how the same extractivist logic that led the world to be in this mess is being applied to deal with this major challenge. And this leads to that complexity that I was talking about, which concerns how some people actually want to profit from the virus. A good, or maybe I, it, would better, it would be better to say a very bad example of the spirit of profit from the virus can be found in the very strange imbrication between national states and the pharmaceutical industry, to which I will allude briefly now. I can't avoid recalling, um, with a bit of irony, that etymologically, the Greek term pharmakon, from which pharmacy and pharmaceutical come from, refers both to a medicine and to a poison. And in fact, in modern Greek, a pharmaki, pharmaki means both a poison and something bitter. So that banal answer that we want COVID to disappear materialized itself in the fastest vaccine, or better, the fastest vaccines in plural, as there are several of them ever to be made. Previously, maybe some of you um, know, mumps, uh, which has uh, taken the American microbiologist Maurice Hillman four years to develop and test, was the fastest vaccine ever made. And I, I'm making a parenthesis here to say that um, if some of you are interested in this, there's an amazing podcast by Radio Lab uh, called The Great Vaccinator. If you Google it, you can find it, in which they, they do an excellent research about how uh, Hillman um, used the cells um, of his daughter who was who got ill with um, with mumps to actually develop this vaccine in, in the super speed of, of four years and the major um, um, the major stimulant for him to be to act so so quickly is that as some of you may know mumps can be um, can be extremely um, dangerous for uh, for men and there were many uh, soldiers who were who were suffering from from the disease. But anyway, so before the COVID um, became the fastest ever made vaccine, mumps was before uh, the, the earliest vaccine to the fastest vaccine to be made in four years. Um, but in fact, it took the 21st century less than one year to create a COVID-19 vaccine that works, which is an incredible achievement. Ironically, it seems to have been easier and faster to invent, test, and produce an effective vaccine for the virus in such a short time frame, then it will be to distribute it evenly across the world. And there are currently over 200 vaccine candidates being developed and tested. The most popular, popular so far is the Oxford University vaccine, which has sold over 2.5 billion doses. The academic institution, together with AstraZeneca, is doling out 500 million vaccines each to India and the US, as well as 400 million vaccines to the European Union. Novavax, the second highest seller of COVID-19 vaccines, has pre-sold 1.3 billion doses. And so far, Pfizer, BioNTech and Moderna have pre-sold 10 and 6% of the total vaccine doses being manufactured, respectively. In terms of pricing, Pfizer, for instance, is selling their vaccines at 26 Canadian dollars per, per dosage. With the current number of dosage already sold by Pfizer, that amounts to a current revenue of almost 17 billion Canadian dollars. And let me explain why I went through this. Because there remains a large production capacity in the world to make both the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines, which is not being used because of intellectual property and patent laws. 
That is, these vaccines could be made in many countries and could be locally distributed, reducing logistical and infrastructural costs and time. But this is not allowed because these vaccines come with an owner. Profit remains more important than life, than many, many, many lives, to be precise. What a few people want from the virus is very different from what a majority of people want from the virus. But like in the story with the bad refrain, the narrative of inequality keeps getting replayed and retold all over again. The result is that only some labs are allowed to produce the vaccines. And of course, they can only do it in limited quantities, which limits the amount of people that can get access to them. But not only this, if you look at the case of Pfizer and Moderna, you see how they largely sell their first year's worth of doses to the world's richest, wealthiest countries. Many of the world's poorest countries, where in fact the vaccines are even more urgent due to the larger difficulties in containing the virus, due to the poor lockdown conditions of people, and due to the lack of good treatment and equipment for those who get sick. And they won't get the vaccine probably before 2022. Basically, there's a large part of the world's population that will have another whole year of anxiety, economic meltdown, sickness, unemployment, and death ahead of them, simply because they were born in a country that is not rich, or even worse, because they were born in a country that has been marginalized and made too dysfunctional and disadvantages and disadvantaged due to the parasitic occupation of another country in the centuries past. There have been some attempts to challenge this, however. And for instance, South Africa and India took a proposal to the World Trade Organization to ban the vaccines patents so that generic versions could be made. However, this proposal was blocked, and by whom? By the USA, by the UK, and the European Union. It's hard to think that the whole world is going through this major challenge together. It is given the opportunity to radically reinvent itself and instead embraces none other than the same old political, financial and nationalistic values. This means that a patent will remain more important than many lives now and in the future, since these labs will not allow generic versions of their drugs. This may lead to COVID being eradicated from some areas while becoming endemic in others. So to return to what that we may want from the virus question, I say that what some want the virus, that some want the virus to perpetuate difference, to perpetuate inequality and segregation. And this is the uneven part of the answer I was alluding to. Some of us want money and profit and status and power from the virus. They're applying the old logics of extractivism and profit to this new problem. Regardless of the dramatic consequences of this attitude, not that I'm diminishing them, but I'm focusing on something else. This is a true crisis of imagination that we're facing here. The fact that there is a dramatic and yet unique opportunity to rethink relationships, to rethink politics and ecologies, which comes with an invitation to embrace a rationale that privileges life to power, that privileges the many to the few, wider economic profits to a greater economic damage. In fact, the global costs of this inequality of access to health are going to be much bigger than the profit of these few pharma companies, which is the absurdity of, of this all, is that we, can, we also cannot afford to be um, entering in this, in this path where a few companies, uh, which in fact become the most powerful companies in, in the world other than, and, um, instead of prioritizing that religion that most states um, have, which is uh, the economy. No? And instead for some agonizing propensity for self-destruction, this we chooses the old damaging vicious options. And I might be essentialist here, you know, and, and, but despite this risk, I would say that this short narrative of COVID unevenness 
reveals how decolonization isn't only a mode of regaining property to what has been unrightful usurped in the past, but is also a fundamental process of preventing that the same errors are repeated in the present and in the future. Those that allow some to take advantage of others, being these human, animal, vegetal, mineral or viral others. Decolonization is therefore an ongoing exercise of struggle, resistance, exorcism, and ultimately of imagination. But there's decolon when we very often, and this term became a, a jargon in the past years, and when this term is used, I think it's, its potential is less about revising the past, about forensically analyzing what happens uh, the wrongdoings of this and this individual of this country, but it's actually a system that is in, intended at propelling, at changing the, the, the future and changing mentalities, changing ingrained naturalized processes that throughout the consolidation of modernity became modus operandi for, for many nations and for also for, for mentalities. You know? So this process of decolonization is actually, in my opinion, is interesting when it's pointing ahead. No? And um, returning to Haraway and to her definition of figures as those entities that have always been where the biological and literary or artistic come together with all the force of the lived reality. I can only hope that in the strange alliance with this virus, which in fact is entering the bodies of many, of too many of us. And if we think that 8% 8, 8 of our bodies is actually, our body mass is actually constituted by retroviruses, it's, uh, it's nothing exceptional that we are being, we are also absorbing this, this virus. Um, but that a strange alliance with this virus, with a strange alliance with this virus, we're capable of summoning an incredible decolonizing figure that in the retro futurist aesthetics and imagery acts as a powerful agent of transformation and progress for the times to come. I believe that without fully knowing it, I've been choosing to cater for the animals, to drink tea looking out of the window, to chat with my beloved ones, and to read the news as a way of slower, slowly conjuring this figure of transformation. I also believe that something similar is happening to all of those who are at their own way, in their own manners, probably alone and lonely too, trying to imagine new ways of being and new ways of living together. The sole fact of being here together, sharing these ideas, proves it better than any other words. We're conjuring change. And even if this may seem little at times, let's not forget that in the matter of anthropomorphic transference, for the better and worse, we are all viral entities too. And so may we together, in the form of, of conclusion, may we together spread our desires, our ideas and our beliefs in ways that are as persuasive as contagious and as diffused as the virus and its corporate respondents. And may the viral political figures be even more transformative and progressive than we can even dare to imagine. Thank you. Thanks so much, Philippa. Um, really thoughtful presentation. Um, and, and something that's not easy to think about. I think so many people have had so many opinions about it. Um, everyone's had an opinion about it. And, and so it's, it's not as easy to just have an opinion than to actually carefully think through things and, and write something as thoughtful um, and as expansive as that. I, I'm touched on so many great things today. I wanna open it up pretty quick, right to the question answered to the audience. Um, so please don't hesitate to um, pop a question into the Q&A. Um, bear with us, of course, as always with this technology as we try to navigate it and figure it all out, but please feel free to do that um, um, as soon as possible. Your, your pharmaceutical, in the meantime, we'll wait for QAs to come in. Um, 
I, the, the pharmaceutical issue is a real fascinating one with the numbers. I mean, I, I just remember when the vaccines were announced in the fall that it didn't shake the stock market for this exact reason that, you know, you'd think the good news with the stock market, the vaccines being released, that the stocks would go up the economy, but, you know, everyone realized that uh, there was just as much money to be made off of not having vaccines as there was having vaccines. And actually, economically, it's, it's not as simple as we kind of think from a government policy um, level mm -hmm. of, 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 of getting out of lockdown for the everyday person and their economic situation quite different, as you pointed out, with the different pharmaceutical giants, including, I mean, I, I really hope that someone like India will do the same things with AIDS, right, and the medication for AIDS, that they, they did break the patent and they went ahead and they broke it. And of course, the pharmaceutical companies were really angry at that. But I think the rest of the world, a lot of the world was very happy there was that patent infringement. And I'm, I'm really curious, as you say, what will happen, how people will notice that because a little more of a global situation a revisit of that conversation um, today. So um, thanks for the details and the facts on, on how that's been proceeding. I mean, I, I, I remained, I, I sort of, I, I did a, a big research on it and I just decided to compile some of the um, most of the figures that I thought were more impressive um, and then there, there's some things that I, I, I mean, I kept aside because it, it didn't make sense, but something that might be worth to share, and I'm, I'm going to copy paste it here in the, in, the, um, in the chat, is a report that was made by this like, historical journal of, of medicine called The Lancet. And The Lancet has, it's a British journal, has had, it, it, throughout the years, it has stayed very um, true to its political, quite radical political visions. And they published a, a really impressive um, report on how exactly the, the US, the UK and the EU um, banned this, this proposal that India and South Africa had to, to ban uh, the patents. And, um, and when I was reading it, I, I mean, it took me somewhere very dark, <laughs> and uh, and and I felt it's funny because it's the first time I'm I'm actually sharing this. this and at some point, I I feel like my talk is in the journey, and then boom, it goes really dark, and then I, I I try to come out of it. But this encountering this report, it was like, whoa, this this is horrible, and. Um, and why are not more people talking about them? They are actually. It's just that we're so bombarded with uh, with with media information that things just eat one another. But still, I'm po I'm pasting it here because it's really it's really mm -hmm. interesting. It's really interesting uh, report. Yeah, Canada's a very. I mean, every situation is is really complicated right now. And I, I know you're you're kind of the British French um, most exposed to at the moment. But you know, Canada's also very complicated in every way you discuss. Um, I mean, they're, they were, reneg I don't know if you know this, but they're renegotiating um, drug regulation prices with Pfizer at the moment. Um, mm. And, and uh, not to the desire of Pfizer. Um, and so there's very complicated issues on the side of drug regulation prices, um, alongside with the supply of the vaccine and all the political negotiations and acquisitions that are going on. So it's even more complicated in each individual state based on these you know, pre, as you pointed out, previous licensing issues and patents and so forth and so on. And, um, and it's again complicated because we can talk about, you know, mercantilism and colonialism in regards to these issues and then decolonization. And of course, Canada on the one hand is, is on one side. Uh, I was not thinking so much, about that, yeah. like the, the ambiguous position. <laughs> yeah, I mean, mean, Canada's a horde. Yeah, I mean, economists said we have more, we bought more doses per capita than any other country in the world is Canada. Um, and, and there's a long history for that, a reason why, which I won't get into politically, but um, yeah. But at the same time, we are sending them to remote communities. So there's this total mm -hmm. issue of, of, um, of complication. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that link. I see, yeah, it's in the, oh, here, let me pop that to the, that's just sent to us. I'll make sure that gets to the, uh, oh, great. Renee, our amazing tech, just bounced back. Are there questions from people? Um, I see a lot of thank yous. I don't know if they're public or not, but or if you can see them. Yeah, they they're are. Not. They're really nice. They're really um, uh, heartwarming uh, um, notes. Um, 
we have one question right off the bat from Arezu. I'll just read it out. Um, I'm assuming you want me to read it out because you didn't raise your hand, Arezu. So um, the, hi, Philippa. Thank you so much for your beautiful prose. Listening to you speak is incredibly soothing. Um, I have two questions for you. One, I am curious about the intended audience for your writing. Was this originally written as a personal piece? Would you interpret your process of writing and dissemination, disseminating your writing as an exercise of self-care or community care slash awareness? Um, I can answer the second, maybe I'll let you answer that one because the second question is quite different. Um, well, my, uh, my audience is you <laughs> in the sense I, I I, so maybe, maybe I should say two things actually. So, um, um, it all actually, it's a very nice story because it all started with Charles inviting me to do this talk. And I enthusiastically and extremely naively telling him, listen, I want to think about, and this was like January. 20, uh, 2020, and I told him, "Listen, I want to, I want to think about the virus, and I want to um, come and, and come to Toronto and speak about this." And and Charles rightly told me, "Like, listen, you are preaching to the converted because um, Toronto, in particular, um, had uh, had a complicated um, uh, moment and experience with with SARS and." Um, most people will know a lot more about this than what you're talking about. So be careful because uh, it might, it might, you, your enthusiasm may not prove uh, that correct and, and, or that justifiable. And I thought he was, and I thought it was really important what he told me. And I actually thought, okay, I'm going to continue thinking about this. And in the meanwhile, I've already, I was already doing a lot of research. And I, I encountered this really incredible expert in um, zoonotic diseases who teaches in New York. She's called Genesee Sodikov. And, and, uh, and I had arranged to meet with her when I was going to Toronto to give this talk and continue the research. So I thought, Charles is right. It's too new in my hand. It doesn't make sense. I'm going to speak about something else. I'm going to continue research. I'm meeting this 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 person in New York and then I'm meeting the two researchers of the Rockefeller Institute while I go there and this will become something else and will become an article for Eflux Journal. Then puff, trips cancelled, one falls after the other, New York falls, Toronto falls, nothing happens, the encounters are moved to Zoom here and there. I have a huge uh, crisis of not knowing what to write, not knowing what to think, just like being paralyzed. My deadline for Eflux Journal just gets collapsed. I receive just notes and notes saying your text is late. I don't even open the emails. I, I develop a sort of straightism where there's like emails that I don't want to read. I, 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 I don't read them. And then all of a sudden, I, I write this text and I write this text in like two days of what the virus wants. I send it to the editor of the Eflux Journal. She doesn't get back to me and five days later, she answers saying, hey, it's too late. The journal is coming out today. We can't publish it. I'm really sorry. Next time, just let me know you're late. And it's something I should know as an editor. So this is happening nowhere. And then because this is March and I'm going through a major existential crisis and everything. It just feels like a mini atomic bomb in my soul. And I even cry thinking, oh, I failed and I didn't do this and what's happening. So I would say that that text, uh, so just to long answer to your question, I, I kept asking maybe myself, who am I writing this for? And maybe I'm writing it for me because I'm becoming really passionate about this topic. But then I have the stimulus to, to write to Reflux Journal and then all of a sudden the writing for me is not enough and it makes me feel extremely disappointed and then it ends up somewhere else and, and, doesn't, and, and the story continues. But I would say that the, the writing and in this particular case, I'm not writing for writing, I'm writing for reading and I'm writing for sharing it with you and I'm writing in a way that is as 
honest and true and everything I shared with you with what all these things that I did these last days feeling I should be preparing my lecture, I should be preparing my lecture, what am I doing, why am I feeding the birds, why am I going out for a dog when I should be, the pressure mounts, but it's it's all true. So basically I, I, I wrote to it as a way to say what I wanted to say in a structured way, as a kind of a memoir of what I wanted to say. So I, I wrote it for, for you just to, to resume in a couple of lines. Maybe we want to go to the, to the second question, Charles, that you mentioned. Sure, we, we actually have someone, um, uh, Holly Ward um, wants to ask you a question. I'll, I think I'll come back. Well, no, let me kind of, I'll, I guess you're right. Sorry, I have two questions in the Q&A, but we'll follow actually, up with the second one. Yeah, the, the other one. Have you encountered any backlash from others or yourself due to animistic empathy towards the virus? Oh, yeah. Most, that's why I was so um, that's why I was so surprised when Leah Kelly, who's a microbiologist, told me, why don't you, instead of trying to do other things, why don't you put the agency in the virus? And that prevents you from um, meddling into, into different cultural realities that you're not familiar with. And I thought, this is incredible that a scientist is actually suggesting me to do this exercise of radical speculation. And I told her like, yeah, but that wouldn't be very accurate. Uh, you just told me 15 minutes ago that the virus is living and non-living. And now you want me to imagine what the virus wants when the virus doesn't even exist as a living form. And she said, well, that's what artists do, no? And he's like, well, I'm not an artist, but yes, I suppose you're right. Um, and, uh, and most, so I would say that most hard scientists, and today I was uh, listening in, in, on the radio, um, someone saying we should stop uh, thinking that this virus is punishing people or is doing this and that. So most scientists would respond that I'm, I'm, I'm just doing a, a, a radical exercise of uh, speculative uh, fabulation or, or, or that I'm trying to write sci-fi, you know? So I do think that at the end, and, and to be fairly honest, in asking what the virus wants, I'm mostly asking um, what, what, uh, what are the conditions that we have created for the distribution and circulation of such an infectious disease, how did how was this possible? So basically, the question is different, but I'm putting it in the agency of 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 the virus because it going back to the question about how I write because it's like it's what makes the action move. You know, in, in the film, you need you need an element that drags everything uh, with it and. Uh, and and this is the the the, vir the viruses like the, what triggers the plot. No? Definitely, we have questions popping up uh, as expected. Um, so let's we have a couple oral ones. So Holly Ward, um, it's great to see you. Um, it'd be great if you could. Uh... Yeah, I'm unmuted. It's oh, actually it's, this. It's Kevin under Holly. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Holly and I are watching on Holly's computer. Um, okay. Philippa, thank you so much for that talk. That was very inspirational. Um, I have a kind of a, a general question, and I wish I could be more precise. But in the beginning of your talk, you were talking about the um, potential of this virus in terms of um, thinking of a new figuration that could propel decolonization in terms of thinking about the structure of our society. And I'm, I guess what I'm wondering is if you could talk a little bit about what you think, and this is why I'm sorry it's a little general, but what you think the role of art and artists are in this kind of figuration uh, in terms of being responsible to, to, to move our figuration of, of society in a decolonial manner? It's a very important question. Um, and I mean, I only exist because I exist in the context of, of contemporary culture and, and art now. So 
um, it's a question that touches the core of, of what makes sense to me. And I would say that um, maybe being generic as well, I would say that it's fundamental for us not to be literal and thinking the gesture of figuration, the potentiality of figuration, and even figures as a noun, not as a literal form of representation, but actually as a system of doing research and of promoting forms of understanding that complement and supplement even those of science. And when I'm saying this, I'm referring to the fact that often, sometimes when um, there was this, for years, there was this long tradition of um, highlighting the importance of artistic research. And artistic research was, was a term that was used and abused and often didn't mean much more than this, than this conjuring this image of an artist Googling here and there, and then literally applying that research and making a work with a more or less conceptual nature in which these different uh, bits and pieces of knowledge were glued and assembled in more or less um, um, inventive systems of association. But I actually think that it's a shame that this concept of artistic research was so much used because actually the huge potential of, 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 of research done in the arts is that of providing a, a, a valid, solid and as relevant and urgent um, version of the world and a form of generating understanding. I, I prefer thinking about understanding than knowledge because knowledge is like information compiled and understanding is when this information is digested, that is as pertinent to comprehend the world and to imagine the future as that of science or biology or physics or any other area of, of um, any other area. And therefore, I, I believe that the contribute that art I don't want to sound like Miss Universe by saying this, but I believe that the contribute that art can provide is exactly that of giving accurate and valid, uh, providing the accurate and valid versions and very lucid versions of the world that can contribute to change. You see what I mean? It's, and, and that are as important and as urgent. And when that's why I, I repeated this quote by, there was two moments of repetitions in the text, one of something I wrote and the other was of this, of this quote of Donna Haraway. And I know Haraway is like, um, it's a little bit like a, an ingredient that is on everyone's uh, plate. But at the same time, when she says that figures are fundamental knots in which biology, hearts and soft science and the humanities and the arts can come together and conjure them. I really, I really believe not in the uh, allegorical potential of this, but in the concrete uh, reality, which is that art has a contribute to, to, to society and to promote emancipation, to promote transformation by providing lucid responses and lucid proposals to um, to the world that are as as important as any other. So even if medicine is more urgent, it's also a, a matter of rhythms. You know? If medicine is more urgent because it's acting now, so if you, um, we cannot replace one thing with the other because they are a sort of a sisterhood of epistemologies that despite having different traditions, um, they have the same way in a way. I don't know if this makes uh, sense. Do you, do you feel, Philippa, that, that that's been taken seriously? I mean, it feels from my perspective that this understanding you have or belief is not really respected for the most part, right? Like what's essential and what's not, or is that, do you, do you feel that, do you feel anyone outside of humanities shares that opinion? 
I mean, if I get scientists to get time <laughs> to think and, and 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 spend time thinking with me, is because they they believe in this. They believe also in 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 the power of, or in the strength of culture to do this. And if we think yes and no, because uh, I mean, there are. There's a there are huge public investments in culture, and let me say something really stupid. And I, I let me say something really stupid. And even if someone who may I may com be compromised, I, I at this point I don't care. Right now, with the team of the Shanghai Biennial, we're going through a substantial amount of troubles with the cultural bureau with censorship. And it's frustrating and it's a huge learning experience. And it's a huge, uh, for me personally, it's a huge um, also uh, example of resilience and of solidarity with also my colleagues in China because I don't know what they're going through since I'm just receiving a, a moderated version of that. But what I comprehend with this is that someone or a series of people in China do believe in the subversive potential of culture. Otherwise, they wouldn't be paying so much attention to what a team of curators is doing uh, for a biennial that for the size of the country is, has a very short communicative strength, no? So if the government in China is so preoccupied with what a biennial in Shanghai is doing with what culture can do, what art can say, despite my frustrations and my nervousness, I think this is amazing <laughs> in the sense that there is a strong belief that art has the potential to change something. Otherwise, we would be allowed to show as many naked people as we want and as many critiques of this and that state that we want and as many um, encouragement to the voices of minorities and of uh, the oppressed as we want. And, and, and since this is not possible, it makes me believe again that, or it makes me believe even more that art has, and that art is being taken a lot more seriously than we sometimes think. Huh? No, it's a great example to bring up. Um... Also, in this, as you mentioned, science fiction is really interesting to mention because actually in China, I know science fiction is one of the most um, politically resistant or political critical genres in that country because it can kind of posit an alternative reality. So, you know, a lot of um, writers are using that genre in that country um, to get around the censorship issues. We have a bunch more questions I want to get to. So uh, you, shout, you gave a shout out to Mitch Akiyama. He's here tonight. So um uh, let's see if there's a question um or not but yeah mitchell you want to you raise your hand hi philippa <laughs> that, thank you so much for that really really beautiful talk um it it brought a lot up for me um so i guess my question is some has something to do with the entanglements that you bring out through talking about the virus that um i think especially because it's not considered viruses aren't living things that they're like really easy scapegoats. <laughs> so there, there's no problem with eradicating them. But um, like I remember early on in the pandemic, there were all sorts of think pieces about the, the destruction of environments and the encroaching of humans onto habitats where these viruses might have been um, less dangerous to us. And it's like our action in relation to these habitats that is, is making these viruses want, want or, or more available to us. Um, so yeah, I, I, I really like that. And I, I'm blown away that it was a scientist who, who put that <laughs> idea in your head. Um, so I, I guess I wanted to ask you, like, do, what's your relationship to the virus now um, after taking seriously the, the, the possibility that it has maybe not desires, but agencies. And um, be, because I think that it, we, we sort of galvanized around <clears throat> our fear of the virus and that's been a screen for a lot of the inequities and uh, things that have, have gone on in the name of capitalism, in the name of colonialism 
on account of the virus. But yeah, I guess it's a, a pretty simple question. Like what, what do you want to say to the virus? And, or, or, or maybe another way of asking it is what's your relationship to the virus out in the world when it's sort of disentangled from um, all the, the political fallout that it's engendering? I don't know if that's a clear question, but. Yeah, I mean, you know, I don't know if I'm going to give a proper answer, but I'm, I guess I'm, I, I am as tired as everyone else of this virus. I'm sick of it. And when I, I mentioned in the opening that I was, uh, I mean, it was, I was preparing a seminar for my teaching and uh, and this, and the seminar was on, on, on Susan Sontag. So this led me to look at, uh, watch a couple of videos of hers. And there's this conversation where she's um, super smart as she always is discussing with John Berger and, and they're there chatting happily about the difference between um, fiction and narrative and storytelling and their different approaches to storytelling and I'm just looking at these two people and thinking they're incredibly lucky because they they don't have this virus colonizing their brain and the only thing we talk about is the virus and at the same time I'm going to prepare a talk about a virus and people are tired about this I should be talking about something else I should be bringing the albatrosses back which is the talk that I at the end had prepared to speak about last year so this to say that while I feel completely saturated about this entity and feeling that it's just like present in every single talk that I have conversation with a friend with family with uh, everyone around me that is just conditioning my life to a level of insanity and slowly driving me crazy. At the same time, I feel that a large part of the responses we have are either emotional and they're embedded in grief and mourning and we're mourning not only for the people we lost or the people that we didn't know but that we know died, but also we're mourning, we're grieving the life we lost, the travel, the, the optimism or whatever. Uh, and despite this, I still think that, or at least I still want to spend time thinking this organism in its thinkable potential, because otherwise we are concentrated to have either an emo emotional or an informative response. So we either read the news and we know how news outlets are, are just wanting us to be addicted to them. So they just like create more and more things that we read and it's more and more information undigested for the most part. Or we read like these huge articles about data and this pharmaceutical research is a good example of like data and data and data that just makes you agonize. Or you have um, emotional responses in the way that your kids are being affected by the virus or in the way your parents are being affected by the virus or your students, your friends and this and that. And we don't use this entity as a, as a, a matter for thinking, you know? And so I guess that uh, what I'm interested in is to try to continue thinking with this bloody thing because it's for me personally is the only way for me to <laughs> to revert the, the 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 relationship we have now and to appropriate it you no know? and not that i need to be uh, not that the virus needs to be my property but to uh, just like come to terms with it so i guess i don't know if i answered your your question i don't think i did I think I just expressed how I position myself in relation to this and what it pushes me to, to desire, which is to say, okay, you're, you're, yes, you're in my brain, you're in my life, you're in my phone, and in my bed, you're everywhere, you just like, I dream with the virus, I, but I'm also going to think with you. It's not only uh, you taking over mine and everyone's lives. Does this make any sense? No, that, that's, that's really fantastic. And it actually really helped me. Uh, I just had a little bit of an epiphany because so, I'm actually getting over COVID right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
yeah, I, I got it in early January oh. and I'm just starting to feel better now. And oh, um, literally, sorry, I thought it was like I'm, I'm, oh, yeah, no, I, I've been literally thinking through COVID for <laughs> a wow. few weeks now. Yeah. And, and the thing that's been really, really powerful about it is just realizing how deeply cultural a disease it is um, in a way that others aren't because we didn't make them culture. So I've been sick with the flu and been way, way sicker, sicker than I was with COVID, but I didn't attribute every single symptom and every single thought and every single um, aspect of my experience to just the regular old flu. And so now even, even though I seem to have cleared it, um, everything is just, I'm trying not to blame things on COVID. I'm not trying to assume that if I'm feeling depressed or something, it's because of COVID, but I can't help because it's, it's just, uh, it's like culture that has allowed COVID to colonize our experience yeah. of COVID in a way. And that, not saying that's a bad thing. I mean, I think it's an essential thing so that we can actually mobilize, but um, it's, I've just been really fascinated to have this deep experience of like a physical encounter with it, but also this deeply cultural encounter and not being able to separate the two at all. So that your answer to my question, which was a terrible question that luckily formulated a really excellent answer is, is very, very meaningful and helpful to me. So thank you. Yeah, that's interesting, Mish, too, because, of course, you're, like, scientifically verified as a COVID person, while there's other people that might have gotten it that don't know, or there's, like, there's that spectrum is just everywhere. So it's a kind of interesting, as, as you kind of point out, cultural paranoia, and, and that kind of leads, I think, to our next question, which is by Barbara Fisher. She, it's a very complex, dense one, Philip. I think you can read it and see it if, because it's long and you want to stay focused. I don't know where they are because I can't. Okay. Oh, there I'll, it is. I can I'll, see it. Sorry. Yeah, so I'll read it out, but you can read along because it's, it's dense and you might want to textually process it if you're like me and uh, challenged um, uh, <laughs> uh, just listening. Thank you for such a great talk. I have a question about the figuration of the virus as a means of human spreading a potentially other image slash imagination of the commons. I am concerned that this metaphor and reality is something that equally applies to the peculiar intensification of paranoic spreading of information and the ultra right. Can we use the image of the virus in quotation marks, without it being capitalized on equally in, other, in the other direction of a new common. And finally, can you perhaps talk more about the emergence of a new slash different common as to how this might be able to exceed in spread to the other? Right wing notion of a, how, sorry, this, and finally, can you perhaps talk about the emergence of a new different common as to how this might be able to exceed in spread to the other right-wing notion of a racist slash white and exclusive common. It's a dense there, but... Um, yeah, thank you, Barbara. It's a, it's a perfect 1 a.m. question. <laughs> Where I feel like, who am I? What did I, what did you ask? Um, I, I think there's several questions in, in one, and I don't know if I'll be capable of, um, of, um, of uh, answering them. Um, I'm, I'm just rereading your question, um, the figuration of the virus as a means in this frame. I don't know if you want to speak and, and, and decompose and just like go through the different knots of your question because there's so many directions that I can go in combining politics with metaphorical references and to your, I see, I seem to deduce that maybe I'm wrong, that you're particularly interested in this notion of communality, you know, and how the virus may trigger this uh, new, new emergencies of communality, but I don't know if you want to. I, I think she can, yeah, I think she's unmuted, so Barbara. Oh, thanks. Um, and again, I so enjoyed your talk. It was so rich um, and also really beautiful, as others have noted. Well, I'm interested. Artists have uh, used the 
idea of the image as a virus, um, right? It uh, borrows the poet used it in Canada, um, general ideas used it as a metaphor, but also of the reality of spreading a different fig a figure um, that um, uh, then can become a commons um, general idea used, for instance, the love logo produced by I mean, this is maybe too detailed, sorry, <laughs> too, yeah. too, too, too local in reference, but it's a powerful metaphor for spreading of for spread, um, really. Um, I'm concerned about sometimes the efficacy of using such a metaphor as the virus. Um, because it cuts both ways, right? Because it seems that um, the way in which misinformation spreads, it's also very, the metaphor can equally apply to scenarios where uh, of the spread of paranoia in particular, which we've seen so powerfully uh, uh, develop um, recently, uh, in particular uh, in white supremacy, I would say. Mm, uh, you yeah. know, and the internet is a kind of enabler of that. So I'm kind of worried about the use of this image or the figure of the virus to describe only what might be a positive development of an idea of the commons when in fact it is equally applicable to other ways of spread and other, other spreads of ideas. So, um. Um, what to say? Uh, I I do, and I I think I I briefly alluded to that in 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 the talk, and I was trying to find it again, um, because I I do see a major difference uh, between virus and virality, you no, know? and in the sense, and in the fact, I don't think it is even ethical to. Um, make a metaphor out of this virus, and if I, I gave that, if I gave that suggestion, or if I, if I led you to think this, um, I apologize because I, I didn't want to. Because we're dealing of some, with something that is concrete, that is killing people while we're speaking, and I think there's no metaphor to take a, to, to, to relate to this virus, which exists. It's completely real, and let's not let's not touch it. Uh, virality is is something very different, and it's a term that I'm actually, I don't know, I find it slightly unnerving, a little bit like the notion of contamination was so used to define the transmissibility of cultural practices and of concepts in in the late 1990s, no, because it 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 expresses a desire to reach as many people as possible through processes of irrationality and often through processes of addiction that, as you mentioned, are highly problematic and often are embedded in politics that are complex and not necessarily the ones I would, I would like to foster and, and, and promote. So what I alluded to in, in my talk that may, you may be referring to as well is when I mentioned that ironically, despite years and years of association with the internet, with digital cultures, in trying to show how people have only a few degrees of separation and how everyone can be friends with everyone. And I'm alluding to um, the systems of connectivity of social media now and how everything technology and, and associated with, with digital technology associated to the internet is um, kind of stimulating individuals to remain connected, to be together, to be all, that we are all the same and that the world is very small. All of a sudden, a microorganism that again, is not even alive, arrives and concretely, materially grounded, not as a figure, but in reality, just shows how interconnected we are and how interconnected we are, not only amongst ourselves humans, but with other species. And in fact, the fact that I can receive a virus 
from a bat, from a pangolin, from a gorilla, from any other animal, just reveals the deep interconnectivity that we are, um, that we live in, and that is real. Um, and so this this virus arrives and and just can invite us to think that this notion of, of viral, virality is actually bullshit because this that we may want to desire is actually really dangerous. And when it arrives, sorry, I sound irritated. I don't want to sound irritated. Um, but when it arrives for real, it's like, like, yeah, we're in deep trouble, no? Mm. And so maybe it's the opposite. It's like, let's rethink the potential consequences of embracing these notions of virality and these notions of connectivity and of circulation and of communality, because they may be the consequent their consequences are not metaphorical and they can be actually much or they can be undesirable. Um, I'm only really touching upon some of the issues that you refer to, but um, I hope this somehow. Um, mirrored some of your your interests and your concerns which i find really important uh thanks that was really great to nuance it and to perhaps pull back it's possible that um from because at the end of your talk you invoke this image as the virus uh and i think i may have taken it into a direction that you didn't intend um so i think you really clarified the way you want to use this concept. Um, thanks a lot. Thank you. I mean, I think it's really interesting. So if I'm getting what you're saying, Philippa, you're saying the, the real virus is a critique of the metaphor of the virus in a certain sense, because it, it's, it is mm -hmm. interesting because most of the kids or the people I teach, right, their only concept of really experiencing viruses is, is as you say, there's a computer virus or as to go viral on social media on a Drake video or a Twitter post or something like this. So um, it's interesting to have a real virus, which is what the metaphor is based on, to come back and critique the mechanisms, um, which in a way the difference doesn't, the difference is there in that contrast. I, I hadn't really thought of that before. So it's kind of a, a brilliant way to think about it. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know if that is that correct in kind of what you're saying, like that, that the social media that which we think of, it's so great. I can't wait till my post goes viral. You know, it's like a it's a it's a badge of honor that like I went viral on the Internet. What you're saying is that the virus going viral itself in reality, which is obviously very damaging and dangerous, is providing a certain sense of, hey, this blanketed kind of acceptance of viral as a positive thing is not inherently like that is, is that kind of yeah exactly and also consider speed if i went yeah. viral it just there's a violence of acceleration and of speed yeah. that is connected to the way in which whatever you generated in the way in which whatever generated was transmitted was spread out that is not necessarily positive. It doesn't. It doesn't mean anything apart from speed and quantity, basically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, on that, I and mean, we were kind of wrapping up. But uh, on this concept of speed, I'm curious. You know, exactly that. The idea of writing something quickly. I mean, you kind of talked about our original conversation of the of what to talk about a year ago and the speed of things happening and the difference, let's say in England at that time versus Toronto, which was, they were quite different situations. And so I'm wondering what has been your guiding principle in writing the text you wrote this summer in preparing this lecture, as you think about it, in something that's so alive in the sense of it happening, developing in real time and the speed of things happening. You brought up Lancelot and so forth. One of the biggest things right now with all the clickbait and all the news obviously is that there's not the normal peer review. There's not the slow processing of information. It's whatever wild theory is out there at the moment. If it's newsworthy, people are grabbing it and throwing it out there. And it's just one theory after another. In a sense, science is speculating more than science fiction is these days almost. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering what's been your guiding principle in taking the courage to write about these things very publicly and take the risk of being wrong um, in that speed. What, what's been your guiding principle as a, as a writer? Um, I don't think, I don't think I'm answering your question. I will say that I, more than a guiding principle, I feel I have guiding mothers. 
because by pure coincidence, um, or maybe not coincidence, but by um, serendipity, they're mostly all women. I've been having these guiding figures that have been incredible um, pensive entities and uh, um, this what the virus wants comes as a response to an incredible talk that I heard Elizabeth Povinelli giving and then uh, reading or rereading Astrid and Imani's to prepare a seminar at St. Martin's in London made me re uh, rethink the importance of figures and of figurations, which have been such an important concept for me, um, inherited from, from Haraway when talking about when species meet, and even when she earlier on conceptualizes the, 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 the cyborg as the ultimate feminist um, figure of, of uh, potential incarnation. Um, and then this summer, talking about uh, talking about talking with Rosie Bridotti, who is actually mourning the death of her father, who died alone in Australia because no one in the family could go and visit him and died of COVID. She is reflecting on mourning and grief as essential gestures for us to overcome the present and the necessity to stay in these griefs and stay in these mourning processes and not overcoming them quickly. And so I would say that, yeah, there are these guiding women that, of course, I, 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 I look from my very humble position and I look up to them as, as references, almost like uh, navigating, looking at the stars, uh, that have been um, fundamental for me to, to, to think with, you know, and, to, to, and even if most of them are not necessarily just writing about the virus, um, also because they come from different genealogies and, and, and they're interested in different things. Um, they've been um, incredible companions to, to, to think and dialogue with, I'd say. Uh, that's, that's great. I mean, I think more than anything during this time, we have a lot of essential services that we, we promote and, and protect, but I think you're, uh, these, these important conversations and mentorships um, is really crucial, I think, for us to stay sane in this age of madness, as we were talking about earlier, as one writer was referencing, um, that the virus is a certain kind of propelling. So um, again, I want to thank all the people who asked questions as part of that conversation to keep us a little bit sane and not go off the rails in our, uh, our paranoid delusions. Um, so it's, it's great to hear everyone's questions. And thank you, Philip, for taking such um, time to answer each of them so thoroughly and taking the time to write such a beautiful text today. So. I uh, just want to thank you um, once again. Thank you, I mean, thank you, Charles, and thank you, everyone. And it's uh, and thank you. There are some um, unexpected uh, dear friends in the audience that also made me very nervous. Going back to the first question about who do I write for, and but yeah, thank you, everyone. Um, it's been yeah, it's been a huge honor and pleasure to be part of this incredible series of lectures. Right. Um, we'll hopefully get you back. And I know some of the students are definitely eager to extend the conversation more one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so uh, again, thanks for that. I want to thank Renee, as you already did, of course, as always, our amazing um, tech who's behind the scenes making it all possible. So again, Renee, thank you for all of that great work. And we'll see everyone February 23rd, which should prove to be a really fascinating conversation with another great writer. Um, so it's nice to get the literary in. The talks are always so much thoughtful when they have that writing behind them. So, all right, everyone take care um, and we'll see you all soon. Bye. Bye.